Beneath the earth we know lie other worlds, hidden from sight, lost in time. But sometimes we can glimpse a lost world through remnants of the past. We definitely got a skull. All oh, right. Mm, it's hard to say. Maybe this story begins with the discovery of unidentified bones. A team of paleontologists will try to figure out whose bones they are and what world they came from. So we've got a time track. That's a start. They were discovered in Kansas, mostly farmland today. But once, Kansas lay beneath a vast sea. It was 82 million years ago, during the age of the dinosaurs. There was another world of giants on Earth. A submerged world where enormous reptiles ruled seas filled with incredible creatures. These most dangerous seas of all time. No living thing was safe. Great marine reptiles disappeared long ago, and time has buried their world. But any of us might still encounter a sea monster. As if from nowhere, the distant past returns. The scientists hope to find not just the fossil of an ancient creature, but a story recorded in its bones. Grab your tools. Rain washed some of the chalk away and exposed it. This is great. Okay. They recognize it as something special. A rare Dolly Karinkops. A Dolly for short. It was a marine reptile of the late Cretaceous. A little bigger than a dolphin. And a fast swimmer. To unravel any story the bones may tell, the investigators will draw on everything they know about marine reptiles. Yeah, it looks like a uh, Hesperornis. Their fossils have been found around the world over decades. Yeah, the nitrates were here was a 
building the lamps. These finds will help the team piece together the story of the dolly. And picture the moment in time when it swam in the sea. In many ways, the dolly's world was far different from ours. The climate was warmer, sea levels were higher, and more of Earth was submerged. This dolly would have lived in a vast inland sea that cut North America in two. Marine reptiles were also found in the waters around Europe, which was a scattering of islands and throughout the world's oceans. In time, they died out and sea levels retreated, exposing vast areas of seabed. Fossils from the ancient oceans turned up on every continent. Discovery in the Australian outback offers clues to how the Dolly's life may have begun. It seems to be laying out in a pretty consistent pattern. 95% of the fossils we're finding here are the bones of juveniles. So many small bones in one area suggest that marine reptiles gathered in protected shallows to give birth. And in North America, that's how the story of this Dolly begins to unfold. Imagine that one of the creatures in the shallows is a pregnant Dolly Karinkops. She gives birth to a male, 18 inches long and colored like his mother. And a female, darker in color, with light patches below her eyes. And it's her life we begin to follow. She and her brother are air breathers. Instinct tells them what they have to do in their first minute alive. From the beginning, the little female and her brother practice skills they'll need one day, when they'll have to leave the safety of the shallows for the dangerous seas beyond. If she survives the perils to come, she'll return here one day and have young of her own. Already, she finds competition for food. There's the Hesperornis, a bird that can't fly and has a beak full of sharp teeth. And the Styxosaurus, a distant cousin of the Dollies, with a supersized neck. An adult can reach 35 feet in length. More than half of it, neck. Its shape makes it a slower swimmer, but it's great for catching fish. soon comes across creatures that move by pumping jets of water from their shells. They're called ammonites, and they thrive in the ancient sea. They have rock-hard armor, and perhaps another defense swim too close like the little female and get a face full of ink. But that doesn't stop a young platycarpus when it wants a snack. Ammonites were once abundant and their fossils have been uncovered often. 
even by a road crew in Texas. kinds of ammonites, and we know when most of them lived. So their fossils are like markers in time. Identify an ammonite, and you can date other less common fossils nearby. That helps place dollies in the long history of marine reptiles. It began some 250 million years ago in the Triassic period, with land reptiles that moved into the sea. They developed webbed feet, than flippers. Some had elaborate armor. Into the Jurassic, they continued to evolve. To see at great depths, some had eyes the size of dinner plates. Top predators grew immense and powerful, reaching their peak in the late Cretaceous, near the end of the dinosaur age. very time when the Dali Karin cops lived. Months have passed, and the female and her brother are now juveniles. But they're still in the safety of the shallows, and unaware of the huge predators in the sea beyond. For now, they're mastering the art of catching their favorite prey, herring-like fish called Encodus. changes for the Dalis. Perhaps it's a change of seasons that causes the Encodus to head out to sea on a migration. The Dalis must follow their main source of food. And that means the young female and her brother must now set out on the journey of their lives. Trailing their mother from the shallows out into the western interior sea. It's about the size of the Mediterranean and only a few hundred feet deep. But somewhere ahead are enormous predators. We know because where those predators once swam, the layered earth holds their remains as if a vast graveyard. Exposed to wind and rain, it gradually reveals what's within. A remarkable discovery was made by Charles Sternberg and his sons, pioneering fossil collectors in the American Midwest. Uh, I covered it so nobody else would notice and disturb it. Uh, yeah. Skull looks like some kind of tylosaur. Big one. Levi, should look over there. About where the It was a creature might. like this the Dollies might encounter in deeper waters. Like waters filled with dangers. The Tusatuthis was a massive hunter like the giant squid of today. Up to 30 feet long and abundant in the inland sea.
It was too big to be attacked by the platycarpus, who settles for smaller prey. Platycarpus itself was fierce, but not in the same league as its larger relative, the creature the Sternbergs had found. Few ocean predators ever would compare with the beast they were uncovering. I think I've got some tail vertebrae over here. Could be lower limb bones, part of a paddle. Skull here, paddle there. Tail vertebrae over there. This fella could be giant size. It was a giant with no enemy. A great reptile called Tylosaurus. the largest and most ferocious creatures of any age. A fossil of a closely related beast tells us more. Its eyes were as big as grapefruits. Cone-shaped teeth filled its jaws and the roof of its mouth perfect for seizing prey. The Tylosaurs were out there, but there were other predators more easily spotted. As fish go, Xyphactinus was gigantic, up to 17 feet long. More than twice the size of the little female dolly, it was a hundred that could kill quickly. And this day, one did. We know what happened from a fossil excavated in the Badlands of Kansas by Charles Sternberg's son, George. Mr. Sternberg, I uh, called from the newspaper. There's a lot of talk about what you found out here. Glad you could come. Well, thank you. Caught a pretty big fish here. What is it exactly? This is a 13-foot Xyphactinus, but there's more to it. As I went through digging out the fossil, I noticed something beneath the ribs. I found some vertebrae, kept on going. Turned out to be an entire animal inside. The victim was a six-foot fish called a gillicus. Such a mouthful that swallowing it killed the Xyphactinus, a prehistoric victim of gluttony. Weeks pass, and the dollies are now far from any shore venturing into a sea turned magical by night. Microscopic plankton give off an eerie glow. Under cover of darkness, the encodus rest, not quite sleeping. Below, 
is a mass spawning of straight-shelled ammonites. Dollies keep their eyes trained for predators. And one is about to change their lives. There's hundreds of shark's teeth here. After a long day hunting fossils, two amateur collectors unearth the wealth of shark's teeth. So many have been found around the world that it's clear sharks were thriving during the age of the sea monsters. The Cretaxi rhina is as big and lethal as the great white of our day. It slices its victims into bite-sized chunks using razor-sharp teeth. There is evidence from a Dutch quarry that ancient sharks fed on even the largest marine reptiles, leaving tooth marks on their bones. female and her brother are being watched. But it's their mother who becomes the target. Their mother is gone, but it isn't over. A smaller shark goes after the young female. She's wounded, but she survives the initial charge. Perhaps the shark was not as lucky. Her injury will heal she'll always carry a shark's tooth embedded in her flipper. The two youngsters must now continue on their own. If the female and her brother are going to survive, They'll have to find food and their way in this vast inland sea. Finally, they see something familiar. A school of Encodus trailed by other dollies. And by the flightless Hesperornis. But nearly anything in the sea can be a meal for a tylosaur. This one died with a full stomach. Yeah, it looks like a uh, Hesperornis. Big as a pelican. Maybe bigger. 
The stomach contents of a single tylosaur reveal its enormous yeah, appetite. So. This looks like the bone of a three to five foot long teleost fish. Got a bone here from a small mosasaur, probably the size of an alligator. And it seems like he swallowed a shark. Big eater, this guy. For several weeks, the travelers push on. The female's flipper is slowly healing, the embedded tooth now surrounded by scar tissue. by a potential meal of squid. One escapes among a colony of crinoids, prehistoric relatives of sea stars, perhaps swept up from the bottom by currents. directly in the sights of a giant. Taking the exposed parts of the skeleton together, skull to tail, I make the specimen about a 29 footer. Yeah. There's something in the stomach. They had found the monster's last meal entombed within its ribs. Because dollies are fast, a Tylosaur's best bet is to catch one by surprise. see the danger coming. The Sternbergs had discovered a story locked in time of two ancient lives intersecting. But why did the predator die so soon after eating the dolly? Talosaurs were likely territorial and aggressive, even with each other. Perhaps an older Talosaur suddenly appeared the younger Talosaur is threatened and tiring, slowed down by the large meal in his stomach. The female dolly is forgotten. The younger Tylosaur is mortally wounded. 
but his story isn't over. His final fate was recorded in stone. A shark's tooth lay near the fossil. Look at this! The female moves on with the others. Soon, the scavenging will begin. of her mother and brother, but she survived. Each year, marine reptiles gather again in the birthing grounds of the shallows. Among them is the dolly with the wounded flipper, now fully grown. She's completed her journey and returned to the waters of her birth and after several seasons, she becomes a mother. Her young will grow larger and stronger, and one day set out on their own journey through the inland sea. Day by day, month by month, life plays out. She sees several litters of her offspring mature and depart on lives of their own. Eventually, a year comes when the mother can't finish the migration. One quiet day, when old age has weakened her body, her life comes to a gentle end. Millions of years worth of days and nights and seasons pass as she lies undisturbed. Sea levels rise and fall. Around the world, continents shift. And volcanic activity changes the face of the Earth. New species appear, and old species vanish, including the last of the sea monsters. Beneath the shifting land, the remains of the great ocean reptiles are turned by time into rock. Daddy? And lie hidden until exposed. Daddy? this time by a summer rain. How are we going to take it out? We may have to plaster the whole thing and take it out in a jacket. Hey, come check this out. There was something unusual about one of the rear flippers. A shark's tooth embedded between the bones.
countless other creatures still buried within the layers of the earth, waiting for us to find them, waiting to tell us stories of our world when it was theirs. first large animals to fly. Their bodies were so bizarre that it's hard to imagine how they got into the air. They were pterosaurs, and they ruled the skies for 150 million years. I'm blown away by these animals. Pterosaurs are probably the weirdest uh, animals that live on this world. They're the closest thing to living dragons the planet has ever seen. But they're not birds, and they're not bats. So what on earth are they? They're impossible animals. They're reptiles, and yet they're flying around. How on earth could these animals ever fly? And can they fly again? We join one team on their quest to build one as they hunt for evidence to unlock the mystery of their flight and piece together clues that may uncover their secrets. We're about to come face to face with the monsters of the sky. One hundred million years ago, the Earth was a place in which many strange monsters swam and roamed. The planet was in the grip of giant reptiles, and the ancient game of hunt and kill played out on a scale we wouldn't recognize today. But there was another dimension to this world, one that's often overlooked, but in many ways is even more remarkable. Our planet was also home to some incredible and mysterious creatures. Flying reptiles, some of them bristling with teeth. Pterosaurs. After insects, pterosaurs were the first animals to fly and they became a global air force. Pterosaurs appeared abruptly in the fossil record 220 million years ago. We still don't really understand how they evolved. But we do know that after they arrived, they spread around the globe, undergoing some of the strangest costume changes in the history of life. Some had short tails, others long. Some were as small as a sparrow, Others were giants. Many were covered with something like hair and sported flamboyant crests. They had outrageous jaws, fine-tuned for hunting. But for all their variety, it was flight that defined them. Somehow, these long-necked, gawky creatures not only worked out how to fly, they perfected the technique. 220 million years ago, this skill set them apart from every other large creature. Birds didn't even exist yet. But pterosaurs ruled the skies.
were only just beginning to solve the mysteries of their reign. What was it like in the world of the pterosaurs? How big did they get? And how does an animal that resembles a broken umbrella get its ungainly body into the air and manage to fly? Led by Dutch engineer and Stanford professor Margot Gerritsen, one team will try to build a model, a lifelike flapping and flying pterosaur. And there are instructions for building a pterosaur. They're written in stone. You have to get everything from the fossil record. So it's fascinating to try to put it all together like one big puzzle. It was a beautiful design something that's extremely hard to duplicate. It's going to be real challenging, Paul, because if you To work out how pterosaurs flew, we need to understand the strength of their bones and how they moved. We also need to work out the shape and construction of their wings and how they flapped to create lift and thrust to power their flight. The Stanford model is in its early stages, more aircraft than animal. But gradually, it'll become more realistic as the team first builds it and then tries to keep it in the air. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Their goal is to uncover the flight secrets of the first large animal to take to the skies. We used to think that birds and bats were the only big flyers in the skies. But a strange discovery near Solnhofen in Germany shattered this myth. This limestone quarry turned up clues about life in a shallow lagoon 150 million years ago. Less than 250 years ago, a quarryman here found something baffling. It seemed to defy explanation. Naturalists of the 1700s fumbled for answers based on familiar known creatures. Some thought it was a type of duck. Others believed it was a kind of bat. Yet others thought the wings would have been used for swimming underwater. But the fossil defied them all. It was unlike anything ever collected before. At the Natural History Museum in Paris, Philippe Taquet walks in the footsteps of the man who finally unraveled the mystery. That sleuth was Georges Cuvier. He was the first person to realize that animals had become extinct and the first to understand what dinosaurs were. And here, two centuries ago, he applied his forensic eye to the German fossil and blew the case wide open. Cuvier received a drawing of this strange petrified animal and he realized suddenly that it was completely a new order of animal. It was a new branch on the tree of life. Cuvier spotted a tiny bone in the jaw, like those found in only one kind of animal. The weird winged creature was a reptile. But what was a reptile doing in the sky? You have a reptile flying? This was completely uh, surprising. How could a cold-blooded, lethargic beast akin to a crocodile launch its bulk into the air?
Cuvier found the answer in the hand. A single finger had grown to enormous size. And Cuvier said, I will call this animal the pterodactyl. That means the wing on the finger. It was a revolution in zoology. Cuvier could only imagine what it looked like when it took to the air. Pterosaurs flew, but it's only recently that we've started to understand how. It's easy to overlook what an incredible amount of skill it takes to fly. To get answers about how pterosaurs did it, we can look at the wings of birds and bats. All flying animals use the bones of the hands and fingers to fly, but they do it in different ways. Birds have lost the fourth and fifth fingers. They take the first three fingers, and these form the supports for the feathers. In bats, it's a different story. The four fingers stretch and control the membrane while the thumb is free. With pterosaurs, the little finger disappeared and the ring finger was stretched dramatically. The signature weirdness of pterosaurs is this one mega finger that supported the entire wing. You see an animal that is like nothing else you've ever seen. It's the most bizarre, ungainly, beautiful creature. I mean, it's flying with, with a finger. Evidence of that finger is elusive. Pterosaur fossils are extremely fragile. It's very rare to get a beautiful specimen of a pterosaur. Nevertheless, Paul Serino did it. A few years ago, on an expedition to Africa, he found a pterosaur where no one expected it. It's a pterosaur bone, uh, probably a wing bone. Missing this end, but this end. Pterosaurs were virtually unknown from Africa. They were just bits and pieces recorded. And it really was an incredible discovery. Before this expedition, major pterosaur discoveries had come from Europe, China, and the Americas. The discovery of our African pterosaur showed they had a global reach. They truly conquered every continent. When Serino found his pterosaur, he also found fossils of a heavyweight predator called Supercroc. That's Sarcosuchus? This is um, Sarcosuchus, the giant crocodile of... Uh, its of jaw alone here. measured nearly and two meters. At, uh, one huge skull. Did pterosaurs clash with this giant? Each creature may have hit where the other was weakest. Pterosaurs may have gone for easy pickings in the super croc's nest. And the croc probably attacked when the awkward pterosaurs were on the ground.
Investigators recently unearthed evidence of a similar conflict, the first of its kind ever discovered. A fossil find in Canada may show that pterosaurs did tangle with dinosaurs. Dinosaur Provincial Park was once a North American Serengeti. Pterosaurs here tried to steer clear of danger on the ground. But they had to eat, and that meant landing. Eons later, a fossil hunter found hints of what may have been one pterosaur's last landing. I walked around a corner and took a couple more steps and looked down and there was uh, this long skinny bone. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. It was part of a pterosaur's mega finger and fragile pterosaur fossils don't usually last long in the open air. Not only that, but the first bone led to several more. And then to an incredible discovery. A tooth from something like a velociraptor sunk into the pterosaur's shin. What had happened here? Below the pterosaurs, raptors were constantly on the hunt. Pterosaurs on the ground were vulnerable. Their power was in the air. Flying was their ultimate survival tool. Pterosaurs dominated the skies, and they did this for 140 million years, which is a tremendously long period of time. Primarily, they did this because they were the first to get into the skies. Before birds evolved, Pterosaurs had the skies to themselves for 70 million years. They spread across the globe and morphed into a wild variety of forms. And aside from the power of flight, they all had one thing in common. Pterosaurs were incredibly effective predators. They could gobble up almost anything they could find. Their jaws tell the story of what they ate. We know of a lot of pterosaurs have no teeth in their jaws. It's quite possible that they were scavengers, and perhaps in some cases they fed on the bodies of dead dinosaurs. Many pterosaurs were aggressive hunters. Some were able to snare their fish on the wing. These big, long, sharp pointed teeth basically are the tools of a fish catcher who wants to make darn sure that he grabs his prey when he sticks his beak into the water. One kind of pterosaur used a sieve of a thousand teeth to strain for crustaceans. 
Other pterosaurs have long, sharp pointed jaws which they use to lever shellfish off rocks or pluck them out of the sand. For all their variety of feeding techniques, pterosaurs were often found by water, shorelines, rivers, and lakes. And water wasn't just a place to eat, it was also a place to be eaten. Tylosaurs, giant marine reptiles measuring up to 15 meters long, lived in prehistoric seas. And above them flew the nyctosaur, its freakish, metre-high head crest, as big as its wing, may have supported a kind of sail. To find prey, the nyctosaur had to fly low. Every pterosaur ambushed from below, many more spread across the globe. The five-metre African pterosaur cast its shadow on duckbills. It cruised over prehistoric turtles. But with every skimming flight over water, it risked being torn from the sky. So to avoid that fate, pterosaurs could not only fly, they could fly well, even at low altitudes. And the evidence of these aerial skills comes not from a new fossil wing, but from ancient tracks preserved in stone. In the past, no one ever thought that pterosaurs could have been skilled flyers. Their clunky bodies seemed to prohibit anything but gliding. But near Toulouse in France, a new piece of evidence has quashed this myth. Two investigators examined the rarest of pterosaur fossils, not petrified bones, but fossilized footprints. It's a unique site in the world. This is the first site that actually preserves pterosaur tracks that everyone agrees are pterosaur tracks. One set of footprints here is as vivid to trained eyes as a series of photographs. It's the only known record of a pterosaur landing and how a flyer lands reveals how well it's able to control its flight. Aeronautical engineer Paul McCready is known for inventing weird flyers, like the Gossamer Albatross, the first human-powered craft to fly across the English Channel. Captivated by pterosaurs, McCready set out in the 1980s to make the giant fly again. His team's biggest challenge was flight control, especially working out how to steer. Fossil expert Kevin Padian advised the project. They're able to get it off the ground, get it up in the air. It was fantastic at the time. We now know that pterosaurs mostly relied on their incredibly sophisticated wings for steering. McCready's wings weren't up to the task. They were made from an unlifelike, rigid carbon fiber. His solution to flight control 
was aeronautical. He created an aeroplane in pterosaur's clothing. Gerritsen, on the other hand, is aiming for a lifelike pterosaur that steers like the real thing. Really what's helping us most is that we know a lot more about pterosaurs. Because lots of fossils have been found. We know much more about how they were built. For example, fossil evidence shows that pterosaurs flew with their heads angled down, not parallel to the ground, as McCready's model did. A lowered head makes flight far more difficult to control, but that's how real pterosaurs did it. Weight is another challenge. The power to weight ratio governs all flight. And here, the model has another advantage. New super light components. The batteries are a lot lighter and very powerful, and that's helping us a lot. The batteries hold 15 times as much power per kilogram as McCready's did. The servo motors are also far smaller, lighter and more powerful. But the biggest difference is the wing. The goal is to solve the steering problem by copying the complexity of a real pterosaur's wing. McCready's wing had only a single moving joint the shoulder. But this wing has five joints. At a runway for remote-controlled aircraft, the model's wings are about to be tested. At this stage, the model is still only part pterosaur. It needs an aeroplane tail to steer, and it uses a propeller for takeoff. But although it may look crude, it boasts one of the most sophisticated wings ever built. Based on clues from pterosaur fossils, there are five movable joints inside the wing for steering. The shoulders rotate. They can also sweep forward and back. The wrists can also rotate and sweep, and the wing can bend at the elbow. The object now is to experiment with these joints. That's the one thing that we're trying to figure out with, with this replica right now. Which of the joint motions are really critical for control? The answer was wired into the real pterosaur's brain, so Mike Luvara will have his work cut out for him. It is a challenge. It's certainly um, like flying a ball, and you've got to keep on trying balancing on top of the ball. OK, here we go. Luvara couldn't react quickly enough to keep the model in the air. I would have loved to make it all the way around, but I think we need to do a little more work. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but it's still a breakthrough. Never before has such an adjustable, lifelike pterosaur wing flown. Something's loose here. I think we popped the elbow. Pterosaurs don't give up their secrets easily. And for a long time, one fundamental fact about these outrageous flyers eluded us. 
Were pterosaur babies born live, like some snakes or lizards, or did they hatch from eggs? This question was answered only recently. In China, two paleontologists uncovered a fossil of a tiny curled up pterosaur. It was a pterosaur chick inside an egg. The discovery of the egg was probably the find of the century because this tells us something about pterosaurs, about how they reproduced, of which we had absolutely no information before. It was pure speculation and suddenly here we have an egg. This still doesn't tell us when young pterosaurs began to fly, but Dave Unwin has a controversial theory. Evidence shows that many baby pterosaurs died far from the nest. We find the fossil remains of these individuals miles out at sea. And the only way they could get there is if they were actually flying animals and they got caught in a storm, ended up dead in the water and were buried in the sediments at the bottom. Could pterosaurs have been able to fly right after hatching? Newborn birds and bats can't because they're awkwardly proportioned. To prove his hunch that pterosaurs could take wing right after birth, Unwin needs more evidence. He's assembled a rare series of fossils, the same kind of pterosaur at three different ages. He measures the length of the bones that make up the arm, then those of the megafinger. Unwin finds that the arm and the megafinger grow at the same rate. So the proportions of the wing don't change. He also measures bones that have nothing to do with flying like the beak, and finds that these proportions do change. So only the flight critical bones keep the same ratio. The evidence about pterosaur hatchlings now comes together. They have all their forelimbs, they have their wing membranes. These tiny little pterosaurs could fly. The model is nearly ready for its next flight test. But its body hasn't quite finished evolving. After its makeover, the replica is so lifelike that it's given a name. Herky, short for Hercules. And now Herky gets an accessory. It's something that real pterosaurs never evolved or needed. A parachute. Pterosaurs were known for their weird head crests. This metal one is part of a system to keep the head pointed into the wind, as real pterosaurs probably did in the air. For this crucial test, a large remote-controlled aeroplane will carry Herky aloft and then drop him. You want to check it? This is going to be our first flight with fur on the wings. It could go unstable, um, but I think in general, generally we're going to be quite all right with it. This is close to being the weirdest thing I've ever flown. Herky must rely on Michael Luvara's reflexes. A real pterosaur had a big advantage. 
a flight computer, its brain. A new discovery suggests that its brain could make precise micro-adjustments of the wing many times a second. In a major breakthrough, recent X-ray scans of their skulls revealed faint imprints of pterosaur brains. Pterosaurs had huge balance organs that were able to measure tiny changes in pitch, yaw, and roll. A large part of the brain helped keep the pterosaur's eyes steady during quick maneuvers, a skill critical for hunting. Controlling flight also required gathering data from the wing as well as from the arm and leg joints that kept the membrane taut. This information was analysed by another processor that was the core of the flight computer. With Levara filling in for Herky's brain and a second pilot controlling the mothership, a gliding test of Herky's lifelike wing begins. Altitude! Okay, one more lap. The pterosaur will be released at a height of over 200 meters. Okay, count down to launch. Five, four, three, two, the drop is clean, but the next step is critical. The head, pointing straight ahead for takeoff, must be angled down into a realistic position. But Herky begins to pitch down. Luvara tries to release the parachute. It doesn't respond. The reason for Herky's failed flight can be found by once more looking at birds and bats. They're the only two large animals alive today to have mastered a particular wing motion that keeps them in the air. It's called the flight stroke. If you want to get up in the air, you have to do a certain kind of motion with your arms. And you can't just flap like this, it doesn't work. It actually requires a stroke that's down and forward, up and back, down and forward, up and back. Pumping wings at high power for a long time is something that only warm-blooded creatures like birds and bats can do. They have a racing metabolism, the equivalent of a V8 engine. Taking to the air requires a lot of energy and it requires sustained energy. If you want to stay up in the air, for safety's sake, you better be able to have a good energy reserve. Otherwise, you run out of gas and fall down in the middle of a big flight. It's not good for you. But pterosaurs were reptiles, and all living reptiles are cold-blooded. Could pterosaurs have been warm-blooded reptiles? There's a convincing clue to suggest that this may have been the case. A fossil recently discovered in Inner Mongolia shows a pterosaur that had fur not only on its wings, but on its body. This was also an animal with a big motor, but only warm-blooded beasts need fur to conserve heat. They're burning energy like man, and they're able to burn that energy in bursts when they really need to. Something about that kind of lifestyle requires a physiology like a bird that is burning fast and hot. 
Maybe pterosaurs would have felt warm if you touched one. They were everything but like today's reptiles. Pterosaurs needed one more feature to execute the flight stroke. The flapping takes a lot of power. And there's a big wings, um, and it's flying at high speed. So we need a big motor. But a big motor adds weight, and analysis of the last flight showed that Herky was already heavy and descended too fast. Why? All this cosmetics that we put on actually took us back in flight ability. So to fly more like a real pterosaur, Herky has to look less like one. Newly shaved and in fighting trim, Herky evolves from glider to flapper. Herky's been worked over, crash tested and refined. He's as close to a real pterosaur as the team can make him. But is he close enough? Wing, finger, and a prayer, Herky takes off for the last time. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Now it's time to flap. But after a single flight stroke, the wings jam. Herky's engine is too weak, and he can't even get his wings back to level. Luvara bails out. Shoot, work. 50 feet, 40, 20, touchdown. No, it doesn't look too bad. I think the yeah. parachute saved us. Yes. Yeah. I think we lost our clutch and gear. Oh, that's it. Yeah, look, look at, at that. that. That's why it didn't flap. <laughs> I think we were spinning the motor yeah. with nothing. Yeah, the yeah. whole clutch system came apart. How oh. about that? Oh, that explains a lot. Well, that also Herky turns out to be a runt. Yeah. Later calculations reveal that his flapping motor had only half the power a real pterosaur would have had. But Herky's wings have still helped to rewrite the book on pterosaur flight. I'm really proud of the design of the wings. We build a wing that behaves beautifully in gliding flight. We can control the shape, and by controlling it, we can, we can steer the pterosaur. So that's been fantastic. The real animals set an almost impossibly high standard. And it was only by building Herky that we've learned just how skilled they were. They had the power of flight. And they used it to conquer the globe. Tenacious hunters, they adapted to different diets. They filtered, probed, scavenged, and in a tour de force of flight control, even grabbed fish on the wing. They were quite amazing that compared to every living animal that I know, every living flyer or man-made flyer, I think the pterosaurs beat them all. But after ruling the skies for 150 million years, 
the sky monsters, and the planet suffered a calamity. An asteroid struck the Earth. One theory suggests that the aftermath wiped out the dinosaurs. The monstrous marine reptiles also disappeared. And pterosaurs, the master flyers, were gone forever. The skies are now left to the birds and the bats. But for all their majesty, they'll never match the grandeur and uniqueness of the greatest creatures ever to take wing. Dragons, of course, are fantastical creatures. Jaws full of teeth, huge wings, these, of course, are myths, never existed, but there were creatures who had all this. They were huge, they had big teeth, they had claws, and they were the pterosaurs. 